V M X twenty four Associate Partners Media Productions Swiss Band The Body Store Regal Sounds Mega Mind Concepts Halotech Africa Berima Republic Clothing Store Olive Events and Deco Mabis Ashran Services For more info call zero two four seven zero one three nine six eight Voice of Tertiary Road to Stardom. Truly African. Being someone who was raised by entrepreneurs, my mother owned her own bookstore and my grandparents owned their own landscaping company. I still was going off the mentality that I was raised behind. And yeah, I definitely tweeted that capitalism wasn't evil, that it was a tool. And a lot of people pushed back and were very expressive about <laughs> how wrong they felt I was. So I just started doing my own research and realized there is a whole structure in place that keeps people poor, keeps people isolated and marginalized, no matter how hard they try. I started going through the rabbit hole of reading and learning more about systems that keep people oppressed. I started reading Wretched of the Earth by Frantz Fanon soon after I found George Jackson's Blood in My Eye. He spoke a lot about the need for social revolution. I really wanted to sort of form a community, like, a, like to have a book club. I selfishly thought there might be people who in the meeting could also help me understand the material that I was struggling to get by myself. The book club is basically just a space where we can read books that are written predominantly by black folks and that usually have some sort of a political theme. Right now we have about 14 chapters. I felt it was really important to not just have chapters all across the country on the outside, but also to have book club chapters inside of prisons and jails because I think information should be free and accessible to everybody. One thing that the state is really good at is making us feel alone in our experiences. It's just important to be in solidarity with our community, even the people, unfortunately, who we don't get to see. We receive letters from our members on the inside all the time. Just yesterday, my friend emailed me a picture of one of our members and like his family. He had just finished the Nation on No Map and he was just going on about how, how much he loved it and how excited he is to be in the program. Those types of connections are really cool to me because that's also one of my favorite books. Having more spaces where we can have more challenging and radical conversations about the world that we live in and how we contribute to violence and destruction. I want to be in community with folks who are learning about not only how those structures came to be, but how to dismantle them. I'm No Name, and this is my brief but spectacular take on community learning and solidarity. someone who was raised by entrepreneurs. My mother owned her own bookstore and my grandparents owned their own landscaping company. I still was going off the mentality that I was raised behind. And yeah, I definitely tweeted that capitalism. Hello, good evening. Wasn't. Welcome to the show. This is The Couch. My name is Amma Pratt. It's a beautiful Tuesday. And this evening we get to have a lovely conversation that, in fact, I refuse to title. It's just, you know, us 
hanging out, you know, people having real deep conversations about life, about politics, about ideology, all the good, great stuff. Now, I'm excited for two main reasons. I'll keep them to myself. I'm sure that you know the reasons why in a minute. I'll leave you um, to know the reason, <laughs> the reason why I'm excited. But let me quickly introduce... Um, my fellow conversationist no actually because it's a conversation we'll introduce ourselves how about that we can do that right yeah. okay so i'll start with you <laughs> okay, okay. um well i'm fatima i also go by no name i am a performing artist in america and yeah a few years back uh, around 2019 i started a book club uh, we promote political education. Recently, we opened up a Radical Hood library in Los Angeles, South Central. And, yeah, that's who I am. Yay! <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, my name is Aja Monet. I'm a poet, an organizer, um, an African, and a collaborator, and conspire with many uh, community organizations, internationalist community organizations for the liberation of poor people everywhere. Good stuff. Yes. Y Your guy. turn, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, my name is Chrissy Pratt Jr. And I work here. I work at Pan African <laughs> Television. <laughs> and I do all the things that you know I do. Finish. All the things I know you do. Okay. As a matter of fact, this is my first time on couch. Yes. Yeah. Listen, this is a moment in history. You know, this is a moment that, 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 I mean, it feels as though daylight went to night and night has come to daylight and, okay, I'm not, you know. I will keep quiet because this is a moment I've been waiting to happen forever. Wow. And yeah, it's finally happened. So, you know. Yes. yes. Yeah, and, and, and I have you two there. lovely ladies to thank for this. Yeah. <laughs> we do what we can. <laughs> you, you have some magical powers. That, that two of you definitely do. Okay, so let, let, let's have this conversation. Um, mm. hmm. I will start with the with with you, sure. uh, Fatima, and it's because of a video that I watched, you know, um, of you earlier, and. So this is going to be the ideological conversation um, and how you were introduced to ideo by ideology, I mean capitalism, socialism, things like that. And you, yeah. you speak about tweeting mm -hmm. about capitalism yes. and saying that capitalism is not evil. Right, right. And that it's evil capitalists that make it evil or something along those lines. Yeah, that's about it. And all the reactions that you got mm -hmm. that got you to go back yes. and research. Yes. And has had you changing um, your worldview or your perception about, and and it's interesting because for a lot of us, for a lot of us, I think that actually I say for most people, ideology never comes to you. It's something that's always because it's never it's not taught in the classroom. It's not conversations that can be had at home <clears throat> or anywhere. So it was very interesting to, for me, you know, because I know about capitalism and socialism and all of these things. Because of, right? Yeah. Because of this exposure. But for a lot of people, that exposure will never come. I don't know if you understand what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Yeah. So, so I want us to have that conversation. And so with you first and that experience, and I'll come to you as an organizer and how you think that we can bring this conversation to the fore. So, so let's start. And of course, Mr. Fash, you come in with your, you know, um, experts' uh, uh, opinions on this. So, so, so you, you, you first. Yeah, yeah, for me, um, well, I, I definitely was raised pro-black. Um, blackness was always talked about, discussed, very visible in my household and, and like my grandparents' home and as well as my mother. Um, there was also this sense of, I don't want to say rebellion, but I think there is something very just liberatory about like, entrepreneurship and, and creating your own thing, especially in a, a space that is so hyper racist, like to be mm -hmm. a black person and to develop any type of a business that is successful, although we understand that these things are rooted in capitalism, mm -hmm. something about that is inherently like antagonistic against, you know, the system mm -hmm. that has been normalized as black people typically just working for a white person. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, because that's how I was raised, I thought that that was like, the end all be all and that's also something that is like typically pushed by a lot of black artists as well um 
black capitalism, black entrepreneurship. So that was really my only understanding. I was never really political until that moment happened online where people were like, absolutely not. You need to read a book. And I'm like, I actually love books. I will pick up a couple books and, and see what I can find. And yeah, it just it led me down the rabbit hole because I think in that tweet, like around the time that I was making those statements, I was just very adamant and wanting to see some type of change in, in our economic condition. And so I thought, well, if this is helping some of us, it might help the many of us. Right. Um, and then upon further research, obviously, that wasn't the case. And for me, it wasn't really I think people were very surprised how quickly I was like, OK, I'm socialist. Like, OK, because <laughs> like if you give me information that's making sense um, and that is non exploitative, I'm going to immediately be like, yes, sign me up. So that's that's what it was for me. Mm. Mm. So, so, so first of all, what, what's your, you know, and there's something that happens a lot um, on Twitter, on Facebook, in, and that's our normal now. Mm. That's our everyday life. Facebook is with us. Twitter is a part of who we are, part of our life. Now, how do we, you know, um, engage such that this can be an outcome? Because I can foresee a situation where the pushback would have been so terrible that instead of her to go and read, she just hit social media. That, that's also a possibility. Let, let's mm-hmm. talk about that first. How, mm-hmm. how, how you sort of engage this way, suddenly so becomes a learning experience, perhaps a life changing experience, mm-hmm. and then we'll talk about organizing. So, so let's talk about that first. Well, I think that this is a segue into organizing. I think like the role of an organizer is to help. Politi- politicize, politically educate the people and and move our people further towards the left that we want to see or the world that we want to see, right? And so I think um, social media has its limitations. It is a very powerful tool that allows us to connect and reach people that seem, you know, intangible or inaccessible. Um, and then somehow we're all in this space in this community and we can actually hear, read, see each other in real time. And so it, it, it is a tool and it can be used for good. I think what we hope for is that the human beings behind the devices that are using them recognize that there are people behind those devices. And so we meet the people where we are. Because while, you know, Fatima probably did read and learn from these interactions on social media, I'm sure that there were many friends who were around her at that time that were also engaging in real conversation in real time, you know. Um, and there are people that I know of, you know, in, in her life, as well as being someone in her life. I would just want to say, I'm really honored to be here with my sister in <laughs> Ghana, you know, with you, bo- with you both. It's, it's a, it really is an honor and it's a privilege. Um, and so, yeah, I think meeting people where they are and then being able to show them how you got to where you are. So her just telling her story right now is going to hopefully open up somebody else's perspective to understanding, oh, well, I could start somewhere. Nobody woke up, we talked about this earlier, being Marxist. You didn't just wake up in the morning and be like, oh, I know the language, I know the ideas. And then the other part of that that I want to leave room for is that my relationship to many of the ideas that I feel politically engaged in now around socialism and you know liberation for all people is came out of experience. It came out of real things that I didn't have language for. I didn't know that there were books about the things that I was experiencing or that there were organizations and places I could go to talk about my father and my my uncle getting locked up and having, you know, no resources to get them what they needed in their commissary or not being able to come from one part of the city to another, knowing that our schools were segregated. You know, these are things that you experience and you think you're alone in that experience. You think you're isolated. And then you start to have discussions with people you love and you see more and more of people of you you know in your community are going through these issues and i think the the hope that we hope that we can only hope for is curiosity you know an openness to learn a willingness to learn i think fatima has a gift in some ways that other folks you know don't really have which is the assumption that well this is my experience this is what it's been and that's all there is that there is to it rather than um, a curiosity to actually learn about what someone else is saying and to know that when people are speaking from a place of pain or hurt a lot of times it's because they've gone through experiences that have resulted in that so when somebody is 
like how dare you talk about this or say this or say that online i think just recognizing it's a human being behind there that was triggered and something in their life's experiences has created the condition by which they respond this way and react this way mm -hmm. and i'll end with there's also just bots there's just not people online there are little you know antagonizers and their whole job is to do that so as an organizer i always believe in real relationship building and having conversations that can grow us into the place we want to be absolutely absolutely uh, mr hart so we'll come to you now i mean you probably are the face of socialism for a lot of us um here in, in ghana so the question then is how were you um, yourself introduced um, to the ideology how did you that engaging with socialism? Well, first of all, I think uh, it's, it's a great honor, you know, to be on this platform. Um, I've read a few things about No Name, and I've read a few things about her, and I never thought for one moment that we'd be sitting together having this conversation. I think that these two comrades are doing a lot of work, they are in the forefront of the struggle to change the world, to make the world a better place and so on. And I'd like to give them the red salute for all the efforts that they are making. Red salute. Yeah. <laughs> Only last week, or two weeks ago, I had the privilege of meeting the Dream Defenders. And we had a beautiful conversation in this very, very studio. I'd like to see this as part of the continuing conversation about the world we live in, the world which is threatened with the thermonuclear war, the world in which many people suffer hunger, illiteracy, disease, where people don't have access to social services, well, this world ought to change. This cannot be the world that we're going to live in forever. This world is so unfair that it needs to change. And this conversation is about changing that world. And if I understand your question correctly, it's about how we come into contact with liberating ideas which then helps us to develop, you know, on the path of, of liberation and socialism and so on. My own experience may not be the same. Everybody takes a different path. Our friends who got committed to socialism just by coming to the Freedom Center and listening to the Freedom Band and having conversations. Our friends who joined the socialist movement of Ghana because some of them have heard me speak on radio or speak on television and so on. They come in different parts and so on. My own experience was different. My father was part of the struggle, of the national liberation struggle which led to our independence. Mm. And eventually became a trade union leader. And was one of the very first people who were sent to Prague in Czechoslovakia to the party school. Mm. So he came back with all these books, learning, Marx, Plekhanov, and so on. Mm. So he had a small library of all these books. And his trade union colleagues used to visit regularly. And they would go into this small room and argue and talk, you know, and we would be serving them with food and so on, you know. And I was then in secondary school from one. And I always said to myself, what are these old chaps doing here? <laughs> you know, what keeps them in this room all the time? And then one day, one of the books that Marx had written, you know, I just, young boy, opened, flip, I was trying to flip through the pages. And something caught my attention. I mean, something that Marx had written, that the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle. I read it over and over again. I was trying to make sense out of it, you know. And then my father walks in and he thinks that I'm, I'm, I'm very disruptive. What are you doing here? Get out of here and so on. So I get out. But every now and then, if I had access, I would go and open through the pages, you know. And not that it made a lot of sense to me, but I was reading. I didn't understand most of the things that I was reading. But mm. I was attracted to this very small room. Mm. That's how it began. Mm. Then I get into secondary school. And as everybody who knows my history knows, I mean, I'm a product of the debating society. So I get to secondary school, and schools are debating. It's, it's competition, you know. And I'm in terms of secondary school, I'm in form two, 
And I'm the lead debater for the school, a cis form school. I'm the lead debater for the school. So we have to read, we have to prepare, and so on. And then some of the, of the, of the seniors introduced me to just logic. Logic, you know. So we started reading Bertrand Roussel, you know, just to make sure that we could, we could understand things and so on. And then from Bertrand Roussel, it led to others. And then we began talking and discussing and so on. And then real life experience. I mean, you can't live in this world and feel comfortable. If you live in this world the way it is today and you are comfortable, something must be wrong with you. I mean, if you drive down the street mm. and you see all these able-bodied, intelligent young people selling toffees, mm -hmm. you know, taking the risk they take and so on. If you drive down this road, you know, uh, which, which links us to Abeka at night and you see people sleeping in those holes under the bridge, you know, if you see children suffering from Koshyoko and so on, if you see the kind of politicians we have and the fact that they have no conscience at all, if you see the kind of exploitation Africa is undergoing and so on, and you don't find something wrong with this world, then you are a problem. Mm -hmm. Okay? If you find something wrong with this mm -hmm. world and you don't get motivated to do something, mm -hmm. to think about how to change it, then there's a problem. Now, if you find something wrong with this world and you begin to look for answers, I'm convinced that the only answer that makes sense mm. is the path to socialism. And that's how I became a socialist. Right, mm. right, right. Okay. That makes total sense, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? That was we are all, yeah. like, <laughs> nodding. We, we, we are all nodding. But, but then I think back to something Fatima said about, in your experience, mm black entrepreneurship yes black ownership mm -hmm. and this is a campaign that raged for a long time where we're told to patronize black business mm -hmm. because the point is that wealth is power right now entrepreneurship is i mean it's capitalism at least that's how it's presented isn't it and so if fatima as a very logical, well-read, conscious person thinks that capitalism is not evil. And, and it, it's interesting the way your choice of words, actually. She, she, she didn't say capitalism is the way. She said it's not evil. <laughs> that, that was, that's a fine balance, isn't it? Right. It, it seems also logical, that, doesn't it? doesn't mm -hmm. it i mean i think for me it does because i knew so many capitalists that were black that were the only people coming back to our communities resourcing them mm -hmm. so for me that's where there was a a bit of tension and understanding mm -hmm. um that mm -hmm. just having money and mm -hmm. and going about mm -hmm. it in this sort of system is not right because you do see some capitalists doing good that's okay. why i said okay there's it's not you know it's not that capitalism is evil it's that evil people are evil right but some people are using this capitalism thing and they're they're using it as a tool positively so perhaps my question really is really mm -hmm. is what what is capitalism what is it for me and my understanding i think capitalism is a socioeconomic system where the means of production are owned by the few and the masses of people have to sell their labor in order to live and exist. And it's an exploitative dynamic because you shouldn't have to sell your labor and your body um, and your spirit and your mind and your heart in order for you to just exist and eat food and, and have health care and, and that sort of thing. So that's, that's how I know capitalism. I also think even outside of that, I think within capitalism, there's just a, a, a culture of hoarding money mm -hmm. you know what i mean because i know people who purport to be socialists but they still we call it generational wealth generational wealth <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's how i see it mm -hmm. right, right. what you want to i think that this most simplest way i've learned to to talk about it to people to so that even a child could possibly understand is mm -hmm. that it's um a system in place or organization in place where profit 
is more important than the people, mm -hmm. where every decision is made in the efforts of profit over the people, um, and where the people do not have equal say in the distribution of that profit and those resources. And so the people who commit to the labor, who do the work, who make the profit possible, who create the wealth, um, do not have say in the distribution of that wealth and the resources. And so the concern becomes select few people manipulate the distribution of those resources for their own gain over the people's gain who actually is not, you know, sucks to be like it's not fair um but more than it not being fair i think it's not sustainable mm. what we're seeing right now is the de complete destruction the deterioration of capitalist systems and structures that are showing us that they cannot take care of the people let alone even the most elite um because <laughs> you know a forest fire don't care how much money you have you know a hurricane doesn't care what what's in your bank account um mm -hmm. uh you know what we've done to the earth for the extraction of all of its natural resources for the profit of the few is coming back to haunt us it's the chickens coming home to roost and so i think um the great equalizer is is really the environment and the world that we live in the planet mm -hmm. we live in is telling us that capitalism is not sustainable mm -hmm. Um, and so I think that we, we are forced for the sake of not just our survival, but this planet and the resources that we're so dependent on to really think of how are we going to change the world? What are the things that we need to do to change not just the material conditions of the people, but of the very ground and land and water and earth and air that we need mm -hmm. to, su to sustain ourselves? Mm -hmm. It's not smart. We're literally leading ourselves into um, destruction and so for me it's just a no-brainer that if we want to keep keep going we need another way this way is not working right. um, and so yeah it just makes no sense to me I think extreme wealth and, and poverty I think to Fatima's point you know it's a we are struggling with the ideas we don't have the solutions we're not here sitting purporting to know what the things are but we see to your point, we see something gravely wrong with the conditions that we are we have normalized that people have kind of just kept going along with, um, and we want to see something else. We want to start to not even start. We want to continue in the legacy and the tradition of people who have said, "No, this is wrong. This is leading us to disaster and destruction, and we need to recalibrate. We need to right. do something else." Right. 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 Mr. I want to talk about uh, ways of organizing society in terms of evil and good and bad and so on. I, I don't think that narrative is appropriate. I like to see how society is organized as something which would achieve the desired results or not. Mm. Okay. And then again, I think it's important for us to understand that we've been moving, society has been moving. I mean, the historical dimension of, 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 of society needs to be understood very clearly. I mean, it's no fault of us as human beings that we began in the primitive communal society, where agriculture was not developed at all, mm -hmm. where people woke up in the morning and forage for food and so on, that was the system of organization of society at the time. And then, of course, the dynamics of that society, the reality of that society, moved us on uh, from primitive communalism to the slave society, where human beings actually owned other human beings yeah. the same way they owned their shoes. Our own experiences taught us that if we were to live in harmony, if we were to live, in a society where people would realize their full aspirations and so on, human beings cannot own other human beings as their property and so on. So we rebelled against that. Humanity rebels against that. And then we built the feudalist society. The feudalist society did not address the fundamental needs, the fundamental problems of mankind. So struggles continued and then capitalists emerged. The capitalist revolution began. Now, we've lived under capitalism for all these years, and we see that capitalism is a hopeless, useless system which cannot address the fundamental problems that all of us have. 
So it's time to fashion a new system to build something uh, which takes care of the inadequacies of capitalism, uh, which, which makes us build a society in which the environment is protected, in which no child goes to bed on an empty stomach, uh, a society in which we banish war, a society in which we spend more resources on the production of food than the production of nuclear weapons and so on, mm. you know, to build a truly human society, a society that is worthy of, our, uh, of us as human beings and so on. Mm. Why? There was a time when, 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 when the transatlantic slave trade, when Africans were captured as beasts of burden and shipped abroad, uh, to develop the base of capitalism. Capital, the capitalism we have today is built on the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. Literally. You understand? Mm. Why? You go to the Christian church, you mm. know, and I'm only recently learning that one of the most favorite songs of Christians, Amazing Grace, you know, was actually written by a slave trader. You understand? And yet, he's venerated in the Christian mm -hmm. church and so on. Why? Time was when slaves were captured and sent to the castles for shipment. And on top of the dungeons where the slaves were kept was the church. Yeah, in Elmina Castle. It was the church, mm. okay? Mm. Time was when the priest actually blessed the slave cargo mm. so that the human beings who had been captured as beasts of burden would arrive safely at their destination and so on. Time was when you could not wear African clothes to church and so on. Why? Our own reality, the complexity of our own reality, the drive to build a society in which we do not discriminate against each other on the basis of our color and so on, led us to abolish all of those things, okay? Clearly, the system of production and distribution hmm, which produces 1% of the population which owns 99% of the total resources of this earth hmm. is untenable, it's not sustainable, it doesn't make sense. We need to move on. That is the driving force for the socialist mobilization which will be successful for that socialist mobilization which will lead to the emergence of socialist states across the world. That is an inevitable reality. It is coming. It is not because we like it or we hate it. Mm. That would happen. Mm. It would happen because the system is not working. Right. It will happen because now in Ghana, we've come to the end of the road. We've come to the point where we are spending 120% of total national revenue debt servicing, debt repayment, and public sector emolument. It doesn't work. We've come to the point where we've gone to the IMF 19 times, and the problems keep getting worse. Clearly, the IMF is not the solution. So our own reality pushes us onto the path of socialism, socialist construction. Right. So I'm hearing two things. One is the natural order, that socialism is the natural order, but also two, that it's like natural evolution. We've gotten to a point where the world itself would make change, right? So, so on, bo on both sides, I'm hearing that. Now, I'm not talking about the natural order. I mean, then I'll be talking like somebody else. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not talking about the natural order. And I'm not talking about change which comes by itself. Mm. It is struggle which brings about that's change. That's my question. It's struggle which that, brings and, about and change. And that's my question. Our conditions mm. compels us to strive for something better than what we have today. Right. That striving is struggle. Right. It is that striving which led to the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade. It is that striving which led to the defeat of colonialism. And it is that striving which would lead to the defeat of neocolonialism today and the building of socialism. Right. It's human effort, human beings working together, acting together, thinking together, and desiring change right. would move us forward. Absolutely, and that is exactly my question. So if you still have a written organized, because that struggle requires organization. It, it won't happen by itself. It would need human beings to start it, to sort of mobilize and, and make it happen. So now I want to talk about the different organizations um, that we are involved in and the things that we do that would take us, you know, um, 
to where we need to go. So I'll start with you, Fatima, and I want to talk about the new name book club. Yes. And talk about how, you know, first of all, how it started, what your vision for it is, and how you intend to use this book club also as an organization, organizational um, tool. Yes. Um, well, around the time when I was starting to develop like my political education, it was one of the most um, amazing things that's ever happened to me in my entire <laughs> life. I don't, I don't know how to describe it when you're like, there's nothing like education and understanding. I'm, anytime I have a deeper understanding of something, it just fuels me and inspires me to share information because I think it, it allows you to access greater tools and it just pushes you towards community also, like towards more people who think and, and have a similar practice that you might have or want to develop. So for me, that's what it was. And I, you know, our library system is, it is ran by like state funding. So it's not necessarily going to have, we, we don't have a George Padmore library in, in, in America. We don't have the types of like revolutionary just spaces just naturally around in the same way. So for me, I thought, okay, well, how can I make sure people can access these books and get these books for free? And also theory is so difficult to understand. Mm. And I mm. was struggling reading. And like I tried to read France for not still had to put it down. Like <laughs> I don't have that level of, yeah. of you know, understanding <laughs> at this current point. But mm. if I'm in a room with other people and you pull up to the book club and you have this deeper understanding, I can learn so much through just talking. And most of the times at our meetings, people don't always even read the books, but they, they leave with the politics because we're having conversation with each other. So for me, that was the most important point. Um, and I think, yeah, it also, it just, it was an amazing idea to me because I like blackness is global. So I feel like we could literally have a book club chapter anywhere black people are, and it could be everywhere like we wanted to have chapters we had one chapter in south africa but it's hard when you're like you don't have people on the ground and things like that so i think i was kind of not really thinking about it as pan-africanist but a, like a little bit in the way that i was trying to formulate it mm -hmm. i did want there to be a, a bridging gap between us and literature is just books are people read mm -hmm. most places you go they're gonna have books so that's kind of why I started the book club and then in terms of like our mutual aid program and sending books to incarcerated folks some of the most like well-read radical revolutionary people i know are literally in prison um and so any way that i can help resource them in their struggle as they organize on the inside that was deeply important to me mm -hmm. and i also feel like slavery in america I feel like America is still a plantation and slavery has not fully been abolished in America and it has been transitioned into incarceration. So for me, I'm like, this is really, really important to me to make sure that our people who are incarcerated don't feel forgotten. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. they know that like, I don't, I don't have the resources to get you out, but I will be in community with you and I will write letters to you and I will, and I will help organize other folks to make sure we can continue to push and remind people and publicize like, you are here still, you know, mm. maybe not with mm. us on the outside, mm. but like we are still mm. connected. Mm. Mm. So that's kind of what it was. Sorry, yeah. that was long winded. Okay. Mm. No, 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 that's good. Actually, I wanted you to um, um, just comment on the name of the book club. It's oh, no name, book club. no name book club. It's like, yeah. Let's talk about that. Why no name book club? Well, I was so every like celebrity book club I've ever seen always starts off with like Oprah's book club or Reese Witherspoon's book club. So I was like, it'll be no names book club. And then I was like, this is too possessive. Oh. It shouldn't be mine. So I like, I took the apostrophe and the S off. Like it wasn't no names anymore. It was no name. And now we're still in the process of trying to change it. Like we, we want to change it to something else because we're a worker cooperative. So we're trying to further, um, you know, reduce the hierarchy within the organization. Like even though we work cooperatively, all, all the conversations around the book club tend to be centered around me, obviously, because of the name and because I started it. So just trying to figure out how not like how to decenter myself mm. is sort of where we're at now i would have thought that no name decenters it perfectly but yeah <laughs> <laughs> well i'm no name so people i mean i you know for me it's like 
Uh, we are dispossessed people. We don't have. We are landless people. Black people in America. Mm -hmm. So like, no name is literally like we don't really have home or space mm -hmm. um and we haven't really been offered much and we mm -hmm. have been invisibilized by the american society mm -hmm. so like no name is really in terms of politics of it is that but in terms of the branding of it and the way the world sees it they see me so right. like right. Right. trying to figure it out right. Right. <laughs> it's, 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 you will figure it out mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you will you are let, figuring let, it out let, let's let's talk hydra let, let, let's talk about you so i mean poets and, and we've had the privilege here on couch of listening to you um, give us something mm. and, um, um, very um, political in, 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 in your themes. And you, but, but you are involved in other things. You, you organize, actually. So let's talk about some of the organizations you are involved in and some of the work that you do. Yeah, I think poetry for me is more about a way of life. It's a perspective. Um, and so it's. Yes, while people are focused as they call themselves or as we see in the world today, because there's just a lack of political education. There's a lack of education about arts and the arts and what the arts are and what art role is in our society, in our community. Mm -hmm. I think most people don't know that what a poet can do is far more than just write a poem um, and that the, po the poetry, I guess the poetry is the metric of how well one is at any craft. So if someone dances like a poet or cooks like a poet or sings like a poet, it shifts and you know what I mean. That means that it's someone that is truly um, upending how we relate to that role or that art, you know? And so I think that a poet is, is really an approach. It's a, it's a praxis, it's a way of life. And I feel that um, while I write poetry and poems, I use I use what I've learned in um, in poetic techniques and metaphor and personification, alliteration and meaning and the search for meaning, the search search for truth and connection. I use that in every facet of my life. So I've helped to facilitate um, a lot of different sorts of things, whether that be events to organize people on one accord and gather to raise funds for causes in our community and to redistribute resources to the places that we know need it and need to be tended to. Um, whether I mean facilitating delegations and thinking artfully and intentionally about who we can bring on delegations and how we can build deeper relationships with people on the ground and folks who are, who are coming on our delegations. Um, language and the way that language is weaponized against our communities, whether that means working with lawyers and um, legal representatives on creating more accessible, um, you know, relationships between lawyers and their clients, thinking about how do we represent the least represented people who have struggled with language um, and, and the politi political realities of language and what it's mm -hmm. done to our people. So there's many different facets of how mm -hmm. my work has shown up in the world. And so I've had a hand in a lot of different things. Um, but I see I you know, from the, the most consistent term that I can find is that I'm a poet and that I organize, you know. And I think we had a conversation leading up that I think is important to own more is that I do see myself as a cultural worker. Mm -hmm. um, a I cultural know. worker. Yeah, I do. I think the marriage of culture, the word cultural and worker are really important uh, political decisions, you know, to name and state, which is I, I do see myself in the labor of shifting culture and in, in the work to liberate our people towards a more socialist you know reality and yeah. so i think that being a cultural worker is really important because we know that i said this before on the, the show but um faviana rodriguez says this but culture precedes policy and so we need to be able to move people in the directions that we want and the way that we do that is by changing the air we breathe which is culture um, and, the, and the water we swim in. And so that's a bit of the work that I've been doing is working with artists and different people who I see as cultural workers, whether or not they see themselves as that. Um, I see them as people who, can't, who, are, who have the, 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 the street's ears, the people's ears. And, and if you have one, two, three, four, five people, you know, what we say in organizing spaces, if you can organize five people, you can organize 10. If you can organize 10, you can organize 15. Like there's no stopping. It's just, it starts, any idea starts with a small group of people who want to make a change and come together and do it. Mm. And if we can get that 
to ripple and and you know if you can if you can make d food you can organize you know if you can throw a party you can, you organize. can organize if you can have a conversation you can organize um if you can dance you can organize so that's really the hope is to mm -hmm. get people to see their power in coming together and changing the conditions we live in i really love what you said and i'm going to keep it in the label of cultural change I, you know it's going to be like a tagline um moving forward i really really like it in the labor of cultural change you know and it sits so well you know with also the feminist agenda but but that's another conversation <laughs> <laughs> that's a part of the conversation that's another yeah. conversation <laughs> <laughs> okay so mr france my question to you um would be and because i i don't think that i should deliver the points of um you and the work you do in terms of organizing i mean that goes without saying but 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 i think you perhaps more than anybody else can answer this question for me and it's the day them us you know um situation when it comes to um organizing um for anything you know um because like we sort of rightly said before nobody's born a Marxist, nobody's born socialist, nobody's born with any of these political ideas. You pick them up on your way as you go and, and all of that. But there's a tendency for people who have clarity, mm. you know, um, mm. to sort of have this us and them kind. And I think it's the, it's the strongest barrier to organizing, you know, and, and, and I want you to comment on that. Well, organizing takes place at different levels and with different philosophies as well. I mean, the, the, the fascist organize, you understand? Very well. The Ku Klux Klan organizes, you know, everybody organizes. It is organization that put Bolsonaro in power, you know. It's organization that put Hitler in power and so on. I mean, the Zionists who currently occupy Palestine, and are causing enormous atrocities organized. So everybody organizes, you understand? Our organization, the way we organize and the target of organization is substantially different from others. We organize from the standpoint of science. Science. Mm? Science, science, science. We are not superstitious. You know, we do not believe that if you go on your knees and pray, tomorrow morning the IMF will give you $3 billion and not take it back. It doesn't happen. Prayer can't solve that problem. You understand? If you have potholes on your streets, you don't go on your knees and pray for the potholes to be filled. And so, so we organize on the basis of science. I mean, reality. True reality. Maybe that's tautological. <laughs> but how else can I say true reality is the basis for organization? Okay. Now, we believe, uh, we believe very, very strongly that empirical analysis, empirical evidence must necessarily point to this part of liberation, this part of socialism. And therefore, even for those who oppose us for now, uh, for those who prefer other options and so on, we would like to work with them. Uh, to examine the facts together, uh, to look at the science together. And if we did that with them, there's no way they can continue to be opposed to us. Mm. Because the facts are clear. Look, we are living in a world in which the United States of America mm, and Russia have piled up enough weapons to destroy this world not once but 10 times over. That's part of our reality. And if you come to recognize that this world can be destroyed, one distraction is more than enough. <laughs> one distraction. But then we can do it 10 <laughs> times over. You've got to be fighting for peace. I mean, think, 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 think about a situation in which everything we have known, everything we have touched, everything we have dreamt about and so on, no longer exists. That will be the result of this thermonuclear war. You understand? And that reality, which is reality, is not fiction. That reality compels us to struggle for peace. You understand? Why? 
We live in this world where some countries actually destroy food uh, in order to stabilize prices. Mm. And in this same world where some countries destroy food in order to stabilize prices, mm. millions are starving. Mm. Millions are starving. Doesn't it make sense that food is not destroyed? And we live in a world in which our farmers can no longer grow their own seeds. They become dependent on Monsanto and others for seed. Yeah. What is the meaning of, of <clears throat> sovereignty and freedom and so on if we can't grow our own food and so on? So we, unlike the fascists and others, uh, we want to destroy every opposition and so on. We want to liberate the opposition. That's the difference. Yeah, Sorry. I wanted to say something too. Go ahead. Um, well, mine is more like a, a question, so I'll let you go. Right. Okay, I just had something to say about yeah. semantics, or at least lang language, because reality is really subjective, mm -hmm. right? Or I think there can be, um, there is truth, and there are material conditions. That's the way that, at least in our spaces, we try to speak from, that there are real material manifestations of the decisions we make and the ideas that we're talking about, mm -hmm. and they, they manifest in everyday physical reality so mm. but there are different realities mm. um i think at least in america we learn very quickly that there are multiple realities that mm. people live mm. that there that there are people who have the ability to move oblivious completely oblivious to the reality that mm. most other folks uh who are in extreme poverty or who have lack to uh, access to to um physical um you know ability there are people with disabilities there's people with um different gender uh identities there's people with different um class analysis there's so many different realities that people are walking into the world with and so i do think that that is important as we organize because i think we assume that we all agree on the reality that we're in that we all agree that everybody sees everything that we see the way that we see it which kind of goes to your question mm which is how do we move from that they versus them. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to talk about the shared common goods that we all have to address. And I think our environment is a very good way to pull people into understanding the truth about the decisions that we're making and how it's affecting one another. Absolutely. You wanted to say something. Yeah, yeah well, mine is more like a question. So. Please, question away. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so we were, we were talking earlier before we got here um, just about you know, Ghana and Kwame Nkrumah and Pan-Africanism. And, you know, your question around organizing kind of just had me thinking about, like, the current state of just blackness and, and like, diasporic interests in the continent, yeah. particularly Ghana. And I, I wouldn't say, I don't want to use the word organize. I wouldn't say there's an effort to organize black Americans and diasporans to come here. But I do think there is a push for mobilizing right. people toward that direction. And, you know, my experience here life-changing amazing i love it so much i've been so welcomed and I've, I've just been spending time in libraries reading mainly and just talking and and learning mm. so i'm in love with it but at the same time there's this tension for me because i am american you know what mm. i mean and when i come here i do come with my american dollar mm. and when we're talking about like why ghana and why africa is in the state that it's in it is largely because of American destabilization and imperialism mm -hmm. and a bunch of other things obviously that go into play but yeah I guess I'm just wondering like how do you all feel about that push for black Americans and diasporans to come back and return and return home um mm -hmm. like what do you all think about that well well, I think creating a community of people is always a useful thing. And people traveling around, seeing different parts of the world, sharing different experiences, broadens our perspective. It enables us to act in more responsible ways and more mature ways and so on. So that in itself is good, it's not bad. But then you look at the rush to Ghana, and there's a certain element of commercialization. Mm. Yeah. Commercialization? Commercialization. Mm -hmm. And people are organizing districts because they make a lot of bucks Money. out mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. You know. So if the motive is just profit making and so on, then I'm uncomfortable with it. But there's a lot more that we can do 
as Africans, whether we are in the diaspora or here, in order to liberate ourselves, to break those shackles of, of slavery and so on. Mm -hmm. So it, it shouldn't be about the profit motive. That's one problem. Mm. Now, the other problem is also a certain posture which I think is arrogant, I think is misinformed and so on. Mm. I mean, people who live in the diaspora, and diaspora, United States of America and so on, and they develop a superior attitude. They think they know it all. They become messiahs and they are coming back to Africa to save the rest of us. I mean, that kind of thinking is not different from the kind of thinking which led Don Diago, Diazam, Buja and so on to come here to civilize us. Mm. It's, 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 it's another trip to civilize the savages. We are not savages. We are human beings like all human beings everywhere in the world. We have problems. These problems are the direct results of the transatlantic slave trade. It is a result of classical colonialism and the result of neocolonialism. If our brothers and sisters come to join us in that struggle to defeat these institutions that keep us down, that will be healthy. That will be something good, you understand? That superior attitude is not very helpful, it's not useful. Then we have to think about those who are promoting this whole come back to Ghana, come back to Africa movement and so on. Who are promoting it? If you look at the government of Ghana, okay, this is a government which has only recently signed an agreement to the United States of America allowing the U.S. to establish a military base in Ghana. Okay? Africa. No, there's a U.S. military base in Ghana. Mm -hmm. Now, if you read that agreement and you're an African, you will weep. Part of the agreement says uh, that if U.S. troops come to Ghana and kill Ghanaians, they cannot be prosecuted in our courts. Wow. Part of the agreement says that if U.S. troops come to Ghana and destroy Ghanaian property, we cannot have recourse to the courts. You understand? The agreement states that U.S. soldiers have more privileges than diplomats under the Geneva Convention. They don't need visas to come here. They don't need passports to come here. All they need is the U.S. Army Identity Card. Even diplomats don't have those privileges. The agreement states that U.S. soldiers, when they come into Ghana, are not subject to inspection. They cannot even be subject to customs inspection. They bring in whatever they like and they take it out without inspection mm. and so on. I, this is atrocious. So if we have a government like this asking you to come back, come back to do what? To join them in this madness? Mm. Mm. You know, so it's important to link up with the diaspora. It's important to work together. But what are we working for? Are we working for a liberation or we are working for the entrenchment of the new colonial order? These are important questions that we should be and asking. And we aren't the first to return. I think there's there. I think part of it is going back to the history and knowing our legacy and tradition is that there are people who have returned before and returned with the effort that you're you're speaking about and struggled with these ideas. So I think that part of it is how are we facilitating the return? Thank you. That's Good. my whole thing. My yeah. whole thing is about the facilitation of the process. So come, come, come come to what? So for instance, I'm listening to Fatima speak about spending a lot of her time in her library and I would never have thought or anticipated that somebody coming home would be interested in library. Now what's the work that I've done there? I, I don't know if I'm making sense. Mm -hmm. So there's come, 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 but there's so much work to be done to make that coming meaningful and I can only hope that a lot of effort is also going into that. Come into and that. learn our history. Yeah. Mm. Come and get the true facts mm -hmm. about the transatlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. Come, visit the Elmina Castle. See the role that Christianity played in our enslavement. Come, live with us. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, look, the first time I went to the United States of America was in 1976, which is not too long ago. And I get asked whether there are cars in my country. Cars, cars. Mm -hmm. And when I say we have cars in my country, I get asked how we park the cars, whether we park the cars on the trees and so on. 
You understand? Yeah. So the ignorance about Africa is so crippling and so on. So come and learn. Don't come as our masters. You're not our masters. Mm. Don't come, come as, 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 come as people live. who know it all. You don't. Don't buy property. Don't, don't <laughs> come understand? and try to <laughs> co-op the land. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a conversation that, need, that, that needs to Yeah, be. we need to have deeper. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a, that's There's so much there's so much there. to, 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 to be talked about, um, even with the coming. But, but yes, the coming is good by itself, right? Yeah, sure. Generally good. Generally good, yes, yes. I think that most of us feel the same way. Yeah. I think for me, we did delegations at to Palestine. We, at least we are sitting so why are we doing? I'm enjoying every moment of me it. Too, <laughs> yeah. Me too, me too. Why are we doing delegations the to the continent? Yeah. But I, I, you know, I'm also contributing to that to that militarization as well. Like I'm paying taxes in America. So for me, it's like, I can't just come and only feel, I know you all are embracing me, but there's also like a level of, I feel terrible about it. You know what I mean? Like I, it really bothers me that I don't have control over the way the resources, my money is being spent. It just, yeah, you, I wish more black come. Americans felt like that. It's just frustrating that like, it is, I, I understand why we feel how we feel about the continent. We have such a, just a romanticization that is a word yeah it's just very like we are we don't have no home so we see africa as like it's this is it you know this is where our people that this is it you do look if if they hadn't come if they hadn't come how could i have had the privilege of sitting on the couch with them that's something good about coming. That's and, true. And not even just yeah. that, with That's your true. own daughter, who has been trying to get you <laughs> yes, on this day. Yes. <laughs> you know, so. Family affair. We're, we're re- 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 reuniting, reestablishing relationships among all of us. I think we are, yeah. we are, we have a lot of healing to do. I think there's a whole other part of this that I ho- hope people know we still need to struggle with is African spirituality, I mean, your discussion around the church mm-hmm. and the colonization of the church and what role does African spirituality play in shaping and shifting our ideas about distribution of resources. While you speak about certain realities, you know, even being a feminist or what that reality adds and what dimensions alter our, perspe- our perspective about how we share resource, how we share space, how we listen, how we return these are all things that I think color, and we need to be in com- we need to be in real space with each other to have yes. these ideas that I, I don't shared and expressed and struggle with them. I don't know so, if that could happen on a computer. Absolutely. It's true. You have to. You do have to come. You absolutely. do have to like. Absolutely. That's so true. at the very basic, if if for nothing at all, if it encourages conversation, then absolutely it's wonderful, isn't it? Yes. Isn't it? And we are socialists. We don't hold on to anything. I can't hold on to Ghana and so it's mine. It's ours. That's true. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Amma. That's a There's good so one. There's so much more I wanted to talk about, but hey. Time. You, you will come. Yes, yes. I think my visa's for four years, so I have <laughs> opportunities <laughs> to oh, come I need to get on your age. level. <laughs> <laughs> I need to get that. Yeah, right? You're not leaving until a few days. I'm leaving tomorrow, but yeah, we'll I'm talk about it. Thursday. Yeah, she's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Yes, I want to check out the school and, and, and everything. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And you're coming back. Oh, of course. Mustafa, and you're coming back to couch. Yeah. <laughs> Please, work your magic, ladies. He has to say yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We got it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so Thank much you for, for having, having us. us. Yeah. Thank you for watching. As always a pleasure. Always a like. Stay with Pan African TV. And let's not forget this. I have to, I have to say this again. Um, in the labor of cultural change, in all of us are cultural workers. I hope that we keep that at the back of our minds and are more conscious.